So I changed my title a bit. I'm uh, Tom from the University of Utah. Um, really, uh, we've seen some kind of amazing success enabled by machines like Blue Waters that allow us to fully sample the conformational space of different uh, biomolecular systems. And often, if you sample for longer, sometimes results turn out to be less accurate than you had hoped um, because you've gotten too much sampling there. So um, what we'd really like to be able to do and this slide would show, um, but I'm going to skip it, is, is understand how RNA changes its conformation and dynamics with the, uh, due to changes in the environment. So a good example would be a riboswitch, switch, which when a ligand concentration gets to a certain uh, concentration, a conformational change occurs and it, it, stop, it alters gene regulation and does other things in, in the body. Now what we've found for the last, oh God, I've been doing this for 26 years or more now, um, when we run simulations that are near an experimental structure, if we run for a short period of time, we stay near that experimental structure. As we get more and more computer power, often we find we move to some new structure that could often be lower in frangy than the uh, correct structure. Um, and this leads us to figure out what's wrong and, and, and move to fix the, that particular problem. And so the good news is short simulations stay near the experimental structure and uh, well reproduce experimental properties like from NMR. But if you run longer, sometimes you can move away from there and never come back. Um, and in the past, we would never were able to fully sample this conformational space. But thanks to uh, awesome performance of Amber on GPUs, using many GPUs, we're able to actually fully sample some of these. And you know, when we found problems, we uh, fixed the force fields in various ways. And there's kind of two ways we can approach converging these conformational distributions. If I had one of David Shaw's Anton machine, I could run a very long MD simulation, but none of us have that unless you work for David Shaw. Uh, there is one that's available at Pittsburgh, the new Anton 2 proposals are due in a few weeks. Um, uh, will be available, but you can only get a week of time on that. And so we explored doing ensembles of independent simulations. Uh, which could exchange information or not, depending uh, when we exchange information, we use replicate exchange uh, to enhance the sampling. And we kind of show uh, through the access to blue waters um, that we could get similar results between uh, independent simulations aggregating the results compared to uh, longer simulations. And Amber on GPUs is fast, so we get more than 200 nanoseconds a day. Uh, that's going to double or more with the new generation of NVIDIA process, uh, GPUs coming out compared to 16 microseconds a day on, on David Shaw's Anton machine. So you don't need that many GPUs to match the power of Anton if the ensemble approach works, and that's a hell of a lot cheaper than buying an Anton machine. So I've talked about this work before. We learned that ensembles of independent simulations can show similar convergence properties for uh, the internal portion of a DNA helix. Uh, and the results are reproducible. There's a couple papers published, so I don't want to revisit that. Uh, this would have been a movie. Um, um, but what we saw was really interesting. If you take purely Watts and Crick um, DNA, idealized uh, DNA, and you average the structure over different periods of time, like a three microsecond time scale, the structures are essentially identical. What it says is that on the time scale of about one to five microseconds, uh, the DNA is effectively uh, averaged out and gives you the same kind of structure, which is kind of counterintuitive because we know DNA breathes and opens. Um, where we see a lot of opening uh, events are on the termini, which should happen on a microsecond time scale, and we see that, but we don't see it in the inside. And it turns out this is probably biologically relevant because you suddenly see signals in the microsecond time scale, there's a mismatch or a Hoogstein base pair or something else. But uh, this has been published. I don't want to talk a lot about it. We kind of try to prove that independent simulations give the same results. So we can run two sets of simulations, aggregate the trajectory data together, uh, calculate the principal components or the, the principal modes of motion of the system. Then we separate the trajectories and project those modes of motion on the, on the two independent data sets. And if they overlap, uh, which for the internal eight base pairs, there's a dotted line and a solid line for each of the different colors the exact same modes of motion were sampled in those two independent trajectories. And we want to look at convergence of structure and dynamics in various different ways. Now, this is some newer results. 
just not even doing replica exchange, just running 100 independent MD trajectories of the Dickerson dodecamer is kind of like the canonical DNA duplex structure. Comparing the older force field from amber and black to the newer force fields, the Czech one and the uh, Parm BSC one uh, force field from Barcelona, and the blue and the red are, are closer to zero. Uh, this is a average, kind of an average how far away you are from the experimental structure as a function of time. And that's because you have dynamics on a fast time scale. But what's truly astonishing to me is this, that the, uh, the root mean squared deviation, if we get rid of the uh, two terminal base pairs on each end, we have sub-angstrom agreement um, with the OL15 force field of uh, 0.53 angstroms in, in one particular water model or 0.44 angstroms uh, in this newer four-point water model called OPC, um, that really these are incredibly close to the NMR structures, average. You'd, so the NMR is presented as a set of five structures. We average them together compared to our time average. And these are over effectively a, a microsecond, or sorry, a millisecond of aggregated MD data. So 100, 11 microsecond trajectories aggregated where we drop the first microsecond. So it's an incredible amount of sampling. And the deviation is, is, is kind of remarkable. If we compare for the OPC, see on the, on the left with the tip 3P, you can see the gray is the one that's shifted a little bit and the blue and the red are almost identical in terms of their structure overlap. With the OPC, we're even closer. It's hard to see there's much deviation between the experimental structure and the, and the actual one. And that's just kind of astonishing. There is differences on the ends, but that's because of terminal base pair opening. And to converge, the terminal base pair opening would require multiple millis milliseconds of simulation to do that. Uh, here's with the older force field in, in black, which has shifted even more. Um, charm is an example. Charm force field doesn't really, it gets about 1.3 angstroms away from the NMR structure with the current Charm 36 type force field. Okay, so we've shown these results before that for a tetra loop, which is a very stable RNA motif, um, we could run a simulation on Anton and it was stable. Um, when we ran uh, uh, longer simulations, we, and what's kind of nice with that is that uh, if you take the data when you're near the experimental structure, you well reproduce um, the NMR observables. But when we run longer simulations, invariably these would fall apart, which was kind of annoying. And uh, even if we run independent simulations, you can see that gradually you start deviating and never coming back. And that was a problem with the force field. Um, but Rather than talk all about the bad things, we also can see some good things if we run the shorter simulations. So we're looking at both the Varkut satellite ribozyme stem loop five, uh, and I won't talk about GAC today. Um, but there was, we know um, that there's two structures of this particular RNA motif that are in the literature, one that has a magnesium bound and one that is without magnesium bound, uh, and they're slightly different. Um, Magnesium positions are kind of shown here uh, in this motif, and you can see how it kind of alters the structure a bit. Um, we wanted to see if we could do the experiments where we go add magnesium to the magnesium free or vice versa, take magnesium away from the magnesium bound and see if we can see these conformational transitions spontaneously. When we looked at the original NMR structures, which is shown on the left, which kind of show the spaghetti variation, um, actually our simulations kind of blew up. And it turned out that we think that this NMR model was not very good, so we went back and re-refined it using the NMR uh, experimental restraints, and we get the picture on the right. That's a much tighter structure, but up in the loop region, there's some variability, and it turns out what we think happens is the magnesium-free structure is moving between multiple conformations, and what happens is the magnesium, when it binds, it traps one particular one. And so we're able to reproduce that spontaneously in the simulation, see this kind of movement to the magnesium bound type structure. Now, normally when you talk about magnesium ions in, in simulations of, you know, atomistic simulations, uh, people say they're terrible. Um, we have these old and poor Van der Waals models. Uh, we're not including polarization effects uh, and really that the performance should be terrible. And we were surprised to see actually that they aren't so bad. And, we investigated a whole series of models. There's some new ones by the MERS lab and also uh, uh, Villa, and uh, the old ones by Ockvist. And there's even some new ones that we call the 1264 potential. So it adds an inverse R to the uh, fourth um, term 
to kind of improve some of the charge interaction. And when we ran these, all of them were able to convert to the magnesium bound structure. So that's when the line moves from a high value to a lower value. We see now these simulations are only on the order of a microsecond. I was talking before about milliseconds of aggregate. Why am I running so short? Well, we're not going to be able to fully sample this particular confirmation without doing uh, advanced replica exchange, which we do, uh, but we haven't in this case. So what we're kind of wanting to see is that we're able to see some of these guys convert and we don't need to run longer to do that. Now, what was interesting is depending on the ion model, they all kind of go to the same place as shown on the top, but these fancy models, this 1264 or a modified one seem to really bind a lot of magnesium in the structure. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's hard to tell because of time scales and whatnot. Um, but what's interesting is if we, with all of the models, we can see this magnesium dependent conformational transition. So this is a case that worked well with the 1264. But we also saw cases where the magnesium is bound in the wrong place and they're trapped for milliseconds or more. Okay. And this is kind of a big issue that we have to grapple with in the field. Now, we know that the 1264 model interactions with water properly models the water magnesium interactions perfectly. Okay? Or not perfectly, but very well, better than any other model. But one, the balance wasn't set up to bind correctly to the RNA. And the question is, how tightly should it bind to the RNA? The experimental number for, for this binding to RNA with the modified 6124 is about 12 to 15 or 12 to 13 and a half kcals per mole of binding affinity with directly attaching to the phosphate. If that's the actual binding affinity, to actually reversibly see that ion come on and off will require tens to hundreds of milliseconds to see that process. We can't easily run 10 to 100 milliseconds. The, the longest ones are probably about one millisecond of aggregated. So do we change the force field to incorrectly model the physics to make the time scale more rapid. Uh, and that's kind of the, the balance we're trying to figure out with these simple models, what we need to do. Um, and yeah, so we still have these issues with force field misbalance, issues with sampling. Um, one interesting example uh, is with the DNA, where if the question is, do you put restraints so you can't do terminal base pair opening? Or can you run long enough to fully sample that base pair opening? Uh, that's going to require, again, tens of milliseconds to do that. Um, now, in real life, if you're going to look at SACS data, which is the, the kind of x-ray crystallography analysis, um, that fraying is going to contribute to the SACS signal, so you would want to include that, but we can't fully sample it yet. Another issue we face in the community is uh, force field and methods interoperability. There's lots of codes out there, Gromax, NAMD, CHARM, AMBER. And do they all give the same results? If I'm running the charm force field in Amber, is it equivalent to running the charm force field in Gromax or not? And we don't really have a good way within the community to easily assess that. Now, charm and Amber, we know we get equivalent energies and forces. We don't know uh, how that, that works with uh, Gromax. And another thing is that oftentimes, judging the convergence or overlap of independent simulations from different groups is difficult because people don't share their data. And they'll come out and say, I've got a new method. I can sample much faster than you. And then when we compare the data, we see that they're actually not the same. Uh, so an example that I've talked about before is simply this tetranucleotide replica exchange. We can converge it very rapidly in multi-dimensional replica exchange, about 200 nanoseconds per replica. In this case, 192 replicas. And that can converge in a day for tetranucleotide on blue water, so just really nice. We can compare lots of different force field distributions. What these show are kind of the populations of conformations away from an A-form reference. And we really should have uh, the first two peaks should be the largest peaks. None of the force fields uh, get that right at present. We can alter the force field now that we can do this fast in blue waters and see that, say, changing the phosphate uh, size of the oxygens making it a little bit less sticky, a little bit larger, uh, increases the population of the, the correct structures, which is very exciting. Uh, we also can see that different water models have an effect, which was a very big surprise to me because many postdocs have ruined their careers on developing water models uh, and left the field. Um, but this new one, this OPC, which is actually very similar to one from David Shaw's, that what they call the TIP3 PD, actually gets the balance better and we now get the correct 
uh, experimental populations of the major and the minor conformation of the tetranucleotides, um, which is kind of exciting. Now, um, what I want to talk about, so here's just an example where uh, there's this method called RECT. It's a replica exchange with continuous tempering from Giovanni Bussi and Trieste. And Alejandro was in the country between two meetings and had a week and decided to come to my lab. So we were actually able to share the trajectories and, and see uh, what the results. Now, of course, their paper says RECT is way more efficient than what Cheatham did in this multidimensional replica exchange, and it's a lot faster. Uh, so you have to use our new method. So I said, well, let's compare the results. And you can see that the light blue distribution, although similar, is not the same as the dark blue, the red, and the black, which were independent, uh, the temperature replica, and then two independent multidimensional replica runs. So if we actually compare the populations, there's a wide variance between the, the, what they're seeing and what we're seeing. Compared to if we look at our two independent simulations, essentially we get a very strong agreement between uh, the results there. Now we also can converge the, the tetra loop, and unfortunately, the confirmation on the on the right there, cluster five, that's the correct experimental geometry. And you can see the bars are pretty low for most of the force fields in amber, um, with the exception of this modified one by Chen Garcia. But even the Chen Garcia, the blue bars, shows effectively a isoenergetic between three different conformations that are populated. Now, the, the other conformations that are shown there, other than the experimental, are not seen in experiment at all. And uh, we have hundreds of structures of the UUC, UUCG tetra loop that are all essentially very, very close to one another. So those are kind of anomalous structures that are uh, representative of misbalance and, uh, and force field issues. Okay. Now, one thing we often also find in the literature is sometimes uh, too little sampling leads to a more publishable result in that uh, if you compare short replica exchange simulations done by my colleagues in the Czech Republic, uh, they showed a nice population of the native uh, geometry. Um, but we show in, in our converged replica exchange runs essentially that the population of the experimental geometry has gone to essentially zero. Um, um, and so what we see is in the shorter simulations, we have a large population of the first peak, which is uh, experimental uh, there. And as we uh, go longer and longer, well, that won't show up, we uh, get less and less of that population. Okay. More recently, we started to play newer games where we've seen some artifacts due to what we call the ladder structure, where a particular part of the molecule wants to move in a particular way that's not representative experiment. We thought that had to do with a misbalance in, in interactions. So we kind of altered the charge artificially on the O2 prime hydroxyl. It doesn't matter what it is. And what it turns out is it, it nicely improves the population of the experimental geometry. But we also find this new structure, the top cluster shown up there, where an ion has now come in and mediates a phosphate, phosphate interaction because we've changed the balance and now this becomes the dominant populated conformation. So we still haven't gotten the force field fully figured out yet for this, these subtle balances. The changes we make are actually very, very tiny. Uh, in the nucleic acid world, we're about 10 years behind the protein community in terms of the stepwise modifications. So I'm hopeful we're gonna get better and better uh, as a community with these uh, subtle interactions. We aren't yet pushing for polarizable force fields. The charm group is with their Drude oscillator. Uh, we still think there's uh, uh, areas to move within these simple force fields that we can get better improvement. And you saw already with the DNA duplex, that agreement is kind of phenomenal how close it is. The loop stuff is, gets to be harder because these non-canonical conformations involve very subtle balance between the interactions with the water, with intramolecular hydrogen bonding, with ions, that we haven't quite figured out the balance yet there. And so uh, with some of these modifications now, the white and the gray, we're getting a better population of the experimental geometry, that cluster five, but we're getting some weird conformations that are stabilized by the potassium ion. And I should just take the salt out. No, that's not a good thing to do either. Um, so we're still trying to figure out uh, where to go with that. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the other projects just briefly. Um, 
We, for a long time, have been developing software for analysis of the trajectories. It started when I was a grad student back in the early 90s with PTRAJ and was taken over by Dan Rowe with CPPTRAJ, it's C++ code. It does tons of different analysis of 3D coordinate arrays, uh, clustering, principal component, and produces derived data time series that can also be clustered or, or analyzed in various ways. And uh, one of the challenges we had on Blue Waters when we first started is we we're doing these large ensemble calculations with hundreds to thousands of independent simulations. And we'd pop up uh, you know, on a node, we'd try to hit all thousand of those ensemble instances to do the, the analysis and it would just kill the, either Lustre or the node or whatever. So we had to move to a distributed parallel um, code to do this. So now we've got the capability that you can do all your ensembles all the analysis simultaneously with an MPI-based code. And then we move to parallelism across files as well, and also parallelism in open MP space. But we never went down the GPU land uh, because GPUs are really hard. Amber's highly optimized, but this general purpose analysis code uh, isn't. And so uh, we were lucky to work with uh, Marius Hall's team and this CUDA chill code. And this is kind of a way to take C plus plus sequential code and generate CUDA code. It's not necessarily gonna be the most efficient, but it's gonna be a lot easier than me trying to write it myself because I'm not really an expert. And so we, the paid pr uh, process was able to help us uh, get some support for this. Um, what we were doing is tr applying it to some very uh, computationally intensive parts of the code, like where you calculate a lot of distances. Um, so an example we just got fairly recently is one thing you often want to do with your trajectory is like with the DNA, you, want to, you don't want to see all the water like in a movie because it's just too complicated to see it's moving around. So we want to say, let's save only the closest 100 waters and look at that and then do some kind of analysis based on the closest 100. So we were able to basically get over 100 fold speed up uh, comparing a sequential XE to a, a single XK node on, on Blue Waters, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and this is with uh, periodic imaging, which is a little more complicated than doing it without the imaging. Um, and you can read through uh, what was required. Uh, you know, the, the chill code is relatively uh, new and helpful. And so when they suddenly pick up a new code that's written in a different style, there's gonna be issues and they, that, that help them overcome some minor bugs and limitations. Uh, and, and we actually have the GPU code in our Git tree that's publicly available now that people can use for um, this. Now, uh, also I was lucky enough to get an Ebola um, rapid grant that's in no cost extension. It was only a one year award. Uh, but this is a really cool system that um, phage display is a way to get random peptides generated. And my colleague, Michael Kay, developed these uh, there, there's this trimer protein that causes the Ebola virus to fuse into a membrane to infect a cell. And he built it as a D amino acid, not the natural amino acid. So phage display selects L amino acids that bind. Then we rebuild, physically build the D amino acid peptides, the inverse image, and those will bind to the, the L amino acid target in, in real life. And they found about five or six peptides that have bound, but the sequence coverage is terrible. It's like one in two billion, and they're only getting these kind of micromolar inhibitors. So our idea was, well, can we use a simulation workflow to take some of their crystal structures and do random modifications to the peptide sequence, evaluate the energies and see if we can find a better inhibitor or guide their experimental process. So we were doing this for a lot of details. Sean's here and is gonna present a poster on this. Uh, but essentially we have a workflow where uh, we're doing a sequence search with Rosetta. We build systems in Amber. We equilibrate it. We run some simulation. We do some analysis and decide whether to continue the simulation or kill it. And what we really wanted to do and, and been working actively on is to get this integrated with the, the Jaw Labs uh, Ensemble Toolkit and the Radical Pilot technology, which is kind of a workflow uh, system that could enable us. And, and this has gotten a group of us collaborating together, Peter Cass and Michael Schertz, Sean New is here and myself and Peter's here, uh, to really think about frameworks for handling large ensembles of 
essentially uh, simulation and analysis workflows that may be static or may even ideally be adaptable and thinking about how we can do that in a MD engine agnostic way and kind of make, uh, facilitate tools that allow people to set these up. Because right now, if you try to do these in Swift or Radical Pilot or Copernicus or others, it, it's actually fairly difficult or heavyweight. Um, we're trying to think if we can generalize it out and make uh, tools available to the community that can make this easier. Okay, so uh, thank my funding from the NIH and NSF, although it looks like I have a lot, it's all running out, we're in no cost extension, but what I do have a lot of is a lot of computer time, um, which is really nice, a lot of time locally. Uh, I had Anton Awards, uh, the Blue Water stuff has been amazing. Um, my seed's currently lapsed, I gotta fix that. 